Asia Tech Podcast. 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 Asia Tech Podcast. My name is Graham Brown. Welcome back. Thanks for joining me. I'm here on my own this evening. And I want to talk to you about what's going on in the world of Asia Tech Podcast, what's happening in the Asian tech ecosystem. A lot to share today. Been a very busy week. New website, new shows, and new reports as well. I'll tell you how you can get hold of all of those. So if you're interested in the Asian tech ecosystem, which I guess you are if you're listening to my show, then I want to share with you all the new resources, uh, starting with the website. We've got a new website. Let me tell you a little bit about what the idea behind the website is. Starting with, let's talk about the URL, atp.show. So if you want to check out Asia Tech Podcast now, go to atp.show. And the reason is, is that 2017 spent most of the year building the podcast, did 170 odd shows, produced every single one of them ourselves and got pretty damn good at the whole production thing and realized, well, actually, it's kind of a shame that this is just, you know, the tool that a two guys can use why not share this with the rest of asia there's a whole you know ecosystem of people out there who have something to say they've got a voice you know why not use asia tech podcast and use that network use that ability to produce these shows and give them the ability to turn their ideas into a show themselves so that's what we're doing you know, it's in sort of at risk of carbon dating myself. It's like building CNN or CNBC. You know, if I can build CNBC with Asia Tech Podcast, but for, you know, five or 10% of the cost that it te- takes or took CNBC to get a million viewers in their daytime programs. But instead of having this generic audience, have a, an audience of people who are specifically interested in the Asian tech startup ecosystem. Wow, that's got to be valuable to somebody. Well, that's the plan. So that's atp.show. And you can go and check it out and you'll notice a, a new look on the website. And if you go and see the layout with the new audio player, um, you'll find that it's got a pretty cool feature, which, I, which I've been using. It's like the audio bookmark. So you can actually click on the bookmarks and it will take you to a specific place within the podcast. So that was a lot of fun working through that. So that's all work in progress at atp.show. The new shows which we are launching. So last week, uh, I, sp- I spoke a little bit about Simon Kemp and Digital Lives Asia. And that's out now. So Digital Lives Asia, all about turning stats into stories. Simon and myself spent the hour um, diving into his world, which is a world of 5,000 charts. He releases that, um, that mega opus magnus, which is the digital. Let me get this. I can't remember the name of the report, but is it digital in 2018? Simon, correct me if I'm wrong. Digital in 2018 report, which is, uh, sponsored by Hootsuite and we are produced by We Are Social which is that report which goes out every year with every single statistic about digital in the world. And, you know, the level of granularity in that data is pretty staggering. So we went into that and just started with some of the headline statistics, which just blew me away. And we went into the world of social media, looked at who are the the heaviest users of social media in Asia, and who are the the lightest users, surprisingly? Japan, right at the bottom of the list, which is surprising if you know your history. And right at the top, Thailand. So if you want to know more about that, go and check out atp.show slash DLA, which stands for Digital Lives Asia, which is Simon and myself rapping about the world of digital. And, you know, lots of good stories in there as well. So that's out now, and we'll be producing one of those every month. A few more shows to share with you on the ATP network. Now, if you know China, you probably know Ashley Galina. Ashley is the same Ashley from Ashley Talks. She's everywhere. 
Uh, she has a YouTube channel, all kinds of, you know, social media presence under Ashley Talks. And, you know, she's doing a great job of helping people understand the Chinese market. And she's just published a book called Unlocking the World's Largest E-Market, which is all about China and Chinese social media, e-commerce, digital, everything. So I think that came out last week and Ashley's been phenomenally busy with publishing that book. She just did a book signing in Hong Kong and that was an Amazon bestseller in its category. And I said to Ashley, look, you know, you're so prolific in the content that you produce, you know, why don't you um, start your own show? And uh, Ashley said to me, well, you know, I thought about it, but like a lot of people in that space that, you know, um, it's just the production side. The production side is always where a lot of people fall down when they think about starting their own podcast. They do three or four and then, you know, they give up because it's either they're producing the content or they're recording or they're, you know, pushing it out, distributing it, or they're, you know, getting new guests and so on. And it's never that sort of continuous momentum that you need to make a podcast work. So I said to Ashley, you know, why don't you bring Ashley Talks to the Asia Tech Podcast Network and we will, you know, we'll we'll give you the platform to do that. And that's what's happening. So I, I recorded the first one today with Ashley and we had our first look at the book, dived into the content in the book. We looked at WeChat, Weibo, and we looked at, you know, what the trends are in China right now and just a top down look at the Chinese market. What sort of mistakes do people make? What are the big mistakes that external brands make or, you know, investors or startup founders make when they go into China? And what are a lot of things that we have wrong as conceptions about China and Chinese consumers? So that whole idea, interestingly, a lot of people still think that, you know, the Chinese consumer is that loud brand avaricious consumer who you see you know, lining up at the Louis Vuitton store. Yet those people still exist, but increasingly less, especially when you go to tier one cities, the consumers are a lot more educated and evolved and simply stuffing them with Italian or French brands just doesn't work anymore. And we're now at a stage where Chinese consumers are, have their own ideas about what kind of brands they want and how they want to participate in brands and so on. And that really is where a lot of companies come unstuck because they still think that the Chinese cons consumer is just this sort of, you know, this mouthpiece who just absorbs consumer brands and will take anything you throw at them. We, we've moved well past that. And in many ways and in many aspects, China is more advanced and especially on the technological side, when you start talking about payments. So if you're interested in China, and if you're not interested in China, then you, you should ask, why aren't you? Because increasingly, China is going to become more of a thing for the rest of the world. If you are interested in China, then go and check out Ashley Talks, which will be launching on the Asia Tech Podcast Network next week. So if you've got ATP.show, You'll see Ashley's face there at some point, and the first show will be out very shortly. And go and check it out, and go check out Ashley's book as well. It's available on Amazon. It's got some great reviews already, and I think it's a great one-on-one introduction to China. And in many ways, it will blow you away. It will blow away a lot of the expectations and help you better navigate that market and be prepared even if you're not going into China China's coming to you I mean we just look at take a look at Jack Ma just the other day in Davos and Jack Ma talking to Donald Trump about you know creating a million jobs in the US and there he is in Davos talking about entrepreneurship so the fact that now the world is comfortable with a successful Chinese role model is very significant because until this point, 
people couldn't name and i when i say people i mean the rest of the world couldn't name one successful chinese business person entrepreneur and jack ma has really pioneered that space and and led the way because once jack ma establishes that this is okay and you know the risk has really been taken out of stepping outside of china and positioning yourself as this global a personality then others will follow because they'll see the benefits this is the point you know people will see the benefits in doing this and they will follow jack ma and do like jack so jack is really the tip of the spear you know what's going to happen in the coming years is a lot more people like jack ma start popping up on western news networks western media we become familiar with these faces and that means that whole china thing is not just about those who are going into china china is now coming to us whether we like it or not you know a lot of the risk sized capital if you go back three two or three asia matters to atp 540 or maybe atp 530 we talk about risk size risk capital moving out of china into southeast asia So what that means is that now the outsized returns for a lot of Chinese investors is do not lie in China. Now Chinese China is a crowded market. It's a crowded trade as they say in the trading parlance. What now is happening is a lot of the money is coming out of China into Southeast Asia, starting in Southeast Asia, looking for new high returns deals. and we're starting to see a lot of activity in that space a lot of activity especially you know with the chinese unicorns looking for bigger returns looking for a growth story that they can go back to their investors so china coming to us is not just a thing which is you know driven by people like jack ma it's also driven by investors looking for bigger returns so it's happening bring this back full circle go and check out Ashley talks on Asia Tech podcast. So that's coming soon. So that's something new I wanted to share with you. What else on the Asia Tech podcast network? Well, a couple of others. There's a new show we're launching called The Start, which is all about the in the weeds nature of starting a business. So it's ATP's The Start, which is a really, you know, it's an entrepreneur's view of everything that you wanted to know about building a business but often couldn't find out there you know you can go and get the stories of Richard Branson or Jack Ma or Gary Vaynerchuk or whoever it is the talking head of the day of the moment telling you about never give up or telling you about you know hustle that's fine that has its place however what is missing in that story is the nuts and bolts of actually building a business for example setting up a company how to raise funds you know what happens when two founders fall out what happens when you want to raise money is it better to get a bank loan a government grant or angel funding a lot of these very technical questions and details are glossed over because a lot of it is assumed so in the context of two founders falling out when two founders join together to form a startup often there never is an assumption that that is a an inevitability that they will fall out because they're getting on really well and you know oh, I don't want to talk about falling out because it might spoil everything that we have right now it's working so fine but it happens right how do you protect yourself you know that's where you need legal advice and often startups don't have access to legal advice and certainly they don't have cash to throw at legal advice but does that mean it's not important well of course not and it's something that we need to talk about because it's something that's really important to us and in the same way raising money often the two options presented to startup founders are you either bootstrap 
in which you know go and you go and find a, a co-working space in Chiang Mai in Thailand and bootstrap your way to the first thousand dollars a month, whatever it might be, you know that very organic way of doing things. Or the second way may be you go and raise funds from seed family and then go and get your series a and so on so those are often the two options presented to startup founders however what's often not talked about are two other options like for example government grants and bank loans and the reason why they're not talked about is obviously two two entities are involved which startup founders tend to avoid banks and governments not because they dislike them it's just because they take time and often startup founders don't have time to spend talking to government agencies or talking to banks however if you go to i mean the other day i was in fukuoka and the default in fukuoka for a business is to go and get money from a bank not because they're somehow you know, 20 or 30 years behind the rest of the world in venture financing, but because it makes sense, you know, when you can borrow money at 1.3% annually, why not borrow it from a bank? Because if you can borrow it from a bank, you're not giving away a chunk of your company. And at 1.3% annually, well, it's almost free. Forgive me for my very lax economics here, but you can see what I mean is that it's not always the way that startup funding is the best option. So Dennis Poe, who a friend of mine who runs uh, Aegis Partners in Singapore, has kindly stepped up and helped bring the concept of the start to reality. And I'm going to work with Dennis to create this series of podcasts and what we want to do is myself dennis and then we'll bring in partners who could be lawyers could be accountants the you know the professional services providers who who make that possible you know where does a startup founder actually get the chance to sit down with an accountant or a lawyer for free for an hour and work out how to structure their company and this, this is a serious issue so for example let's say you uh a Vietnamese company and your Vietnamese founder, well, 99% of the Vietnamese founders are probably going to set up in Vietnam because of language, because it's obvious, because, you know, they don't know what the options are. However, if they're raising finance, then at some point to access a bigger market, they may want to get outside of Vietnam. They may want to set up their top company in Singapore or Hong Kong, where they can have a, a better access to funding, more credibility. Uh, investors, more you know, external investors, more likely to invest in a company if it's based in Singapore than they are in Vietnam. Nothing against Vietnam; it's just how things are because the structure in Singapore is much more favourable towards an investor there, and they're more used to it. However, having that kind of advice is very difficult to find. So, actually, to sit down and work through these scenarios. Is something that we want to work out in the start. And the idea is, is myself and Dennis and these partners, and it could be specific people for specific challenges, plus a startup sitting in that round table situation. And that startup to come in and say, Hey, look, you know, I'm a startup. You know, I'm a gaming startup. I'm two people. We put all our own money into this app and we are six months down the road and we are facing this challenge and this challenge is financial, legal, whatever it may be. And then to talk that through honestly and share that experience in the show. That is the goal of the start. And as I said to Dennis, it's, you know, this is an opportunity for people to learn in an in a environment where they would never get that, such an opportunity. So where, as I said, where do people get that chance to sit down and learn those specifics so really, that's going to, you know, we have ideas about what kind of common questions startup founders have, because we work with startup founders all the time, whether it's advisors, investors, and whether here on the show, and Dennis certainly does when people come to Singapore to set up their companies there or help raise them, help them raise finance. So 
we will download some of those common questions and challenges in the first few episodes. And then from there, you know, it will be a and a session where people have their questions to say, you know, it's like ask Dennis, you know, what's the best structure? Should I set up in Hong Kong or should I set up in Singapore? What's the best vesting procedure for founders? If one of the founders happens to, you know, want to take a different path of the company and so on, have all of that covered. So that's a new show on ATP Network, which will be starting soon on the other side of Chinese New Year. Um, so there's three shows. There's Ashley Talk, Simon Kemp's Digital Lives Asia, and The Start, which is coming soon. And I have another show as well, which I've yet to record, but I'm really excited about this. My friend Carl Ellicott, who um, from Read Write Web or Read Write Labs, as it's now known here in Asia, the the accelerator side of things, has, uh, you know, has a very interesting life where he basically lives between San Francisco's Valley and the Greater Bay. So he always lives like between the two Bay areas. So you have San Francisco Bay and the Greater Bay, which is that whole Hong Kong, Shenzhen area, that Pearl Delta in China and Hong Kong. So, you know, that, that next hub, which is going to be the global startup financial capital of the world within a generation. He lives between those two hubs. So it's fascinating just talking to him about his life and the travels and the challenges of living that lifestyle, as well as the experiences he has with, you know, you get so much insight living between those two worlds that, it's too much for one person just to keep all that to themselves. So I said to Carl, hey, look, we, you know, he's telling me these stories. Like, we've got to make this into a show because by sharing that information, you're not only unlocking that world to the West, people outside of China, but you're also blazing a trail in the same way. We talked about Jack Ma going the other way. You're blazing a trail for people who may be considering Asia as an option. And that's exciting because more and more people are doing just that. So we'll start seeing that as a thing, he says with air quotes. You can't see me in the studio here, but that's a thing that's going to happen in the next few years is that whole moving to Asia and that, you know, seeing the opportunity that Asia presents. And, and, you know, if somebody from San Francisco can look at the Greater Bay and think, hey, this is a really great opportunity, it speaks a lot about what opportunity that region of the world really presents because the San Francisco area possibly is the best startup ecosystem in the world. So to see opportunity elsewhere, well, there you go. So that show coming soon to ATP's network, no title to share with you now, but it's something Jason Bourne style lifestyle in the world of startups. So working title, watch it, watch this space. So let's talk about the Asia Matters report because parts one, two, three, four are out. And it it's a nice bridge that seg between that West to East transition, re- referring back to the Carl Ellicott story the whole report focusing on the merging of these two worlds. And what you have is, you know, in parts one or two of the reports, you've got everything about the infrastructure. So you've got about the startup ecosystems. You've got the, the mega cities, investment. You've got technology. All of that infrastructure that goes into making startup ecosystems in Asia. And you've you have the 15 startup cities, which are ranked across 14 factors. You have all the information about the mega cities and the GDP growth in these countries. That's all in parts one and two of the Asia Matters report. And if you want to go and get yourself a copy of Asia Matters for free, there's a new microsite for that. It's Asia Tech Research. AsiaTechResearch.com. Go get yourself a copy or four of the reports are all free, uh, but be warned, be warned. 501 slides I counted in those four reports. But here's the thing, you know, if you're creating a pitch deck or you're putting together a presentation or you're doing a conference, you need that one slide. It's in there. 
It's in that for that report, as you say, in one of those four sections of the report, there is that slide that you're looking for. So if you're looking for a slide about e-commerce in China, it's there. It's in report number four, slide 10. Go and check it out and you'll find something useful in there. And in, in a way, I'm finding that people are challenged as well by the content. It's not just a whole bunch of data. You know, there's a narrative in there which is challenging people and it's great because it's creating a conversation. And that is the purpose of the Asia Matters report. So as I said, asiatechresearch.com, go and get yourself a copy of that report. And bringing it back to the conversation about Kyle is one of the key themes in the report was about how East and West are merging and there is a lot of idea flow and flow of people as well between these two markets. What's happening is that in on the one hand, you've got people like Jack Ma bringing all of that Asia to the US and the West. And that's really exciting because they're bringing what they've learned. They're bringing their capital. They're bringing their infrastructure. They're bringing their technology. And we will all benefit from that. And then the other way, we've got people going from the West to the East, which is people who see the opportunity, maybe for them and their specific skill set, it's a better opportunity than what they're leaving behind. And there's a whole generation of people now who have moved to Asia to try it out, to see if it offers them more than it did in their home country. So that's a real fusion of ideas because in both cases, people are bringing something to the table that doesn't exist. You know, if you go to Asia, if you go to China, something like Ashley, we talk about Ashley talks, something like Ashley went to China and even though she's not Chinese, she offers something to the Chinese market and she sees it in a way that the local Chinese people, you know, don't see it because they are myopic to, you know, things which outside of their everyday experience, which is natural anywhere in the world, is that when you come from the outside, you see things a little bit differently. And that can be a real strength in many cases. And in some way, for some people, that can be a disadvantage. But in many cases, you can turn that to a real advantage. And that's why often people going into new markets from the outside, if they succeed, they succeed very well. They have mobility, they get access to people that they wouldn't do naturally back home. And in a way, I think a key part of this is because they leave a lot of their baggage behind, then they have nothing to lose. I've certainly experienced this. I've lived in Japan originally in 1995, 1995, 1996, 1997. I came to Japan. It's my first sort of experience in living abroad. And then I'm living in Japan now. And I've lived in different countries all over the world. And what I find is that, you know, when you move to a new country, there's a real energy of moving because you, for somebody to move to a country in the first place, they have to be already a subset of a bigger group of people who want to make change. So there's this, imagine society is this big Venn diagram. And we're talking about the, the whole ecosystem of the world of business. There's a big, big circle of all people who are in business. And then within that circle, there's a subset of people who want to change. So they want to make a better life for themselves. They want to put a dent in the universe, to use Steve Jobs' term. And then within that subset, there's another smaller subset, which is people who've actually got off their ass paid the price, the, the pain, the cost of moving to a new country and often moving to a new country and starting from right at the bottom. And not everybody wants to do that. So the people who have moved to a new country are a subset of a subset of a subset, which is fascinating because that makes a very special group, a very dynamic group. Not everybody succeeds, but those that do succeed usually go very far. So where I'm going with this conversation, Asia Matters, and those people I talked about on the Asia Tech Podcast Network, those new shows, these people have stories which show 
this real sort of dynam dynamism between these markets and people who have moved somewhere. And I think as we're going to start seeing in coming years, more and more of these types of people moving from outside of Asia into Asia and making a real success of it. Until now, these people were exceptional. They're very few and far between. And maybe you heard of one back from university, somebody who did this. But now I see more and more of this. In the same way, this goes back to Jim Rogers' quote, which is the opening quote of the Asia Matters report. And he says, if you were smart in 1807, you moved your family to London. If you were smart in 1907, you moved your family to New York. And if you were smart in 2007, you moved your family to Asia. Let's think about that. Jim Rogers, a lot of respect for. I mean, he has a very well-established history in the world of finance. Uh, I'm not sure exactly where he comes in, but I'm not sure if he was actually part of the quantum fund, Soros's quantum fund, but he has a very well-established uh, legacy. He is a very well-known name. He's often on TV, that guy with the, you know, the, the bow tie. And he was one of the first people that I know to tap into the old Soviet bloc, the communist bloc. So he was there in the 80s. And he was into China in the 80s. You know, think about this, 30 years ago, we're talking about China now. I mean, Ashley's writing this book in 2018 about the world's largest e-market. Jim Rogers was there 30 years ago. And nobody at that time was thinking about China as an opportunity. But Jim Rogers was because he saw something and he got on. And the reason why he saw something, he got on his motorbike and he drove around. <laughs> he rode around these countries and he, his book was called uh, Investment Biker. You may have seen it in the bookstores. And he, he rode around these countries and he got a, a perspective on Asia that you couldn't have got anywhere else because he actually got off the bike and talked to people and learned about culture and interacted with people and saw the change in these markets and the optimism and the entrepreneurialism, the hustle from the grassroots level. And that's really fascinating because you can't get that kind of insight reading a book necessarily. And you can't get that insight from sitting in an office going through sets of Excel. You can only get that human insight when you go somewhere on the ground, on the road and talk to people. And he documented that journey and he saw what was happening. And having lived in many different countries as he had, I mean, he's an American, but he, he, I believe went to university in Oxford, had a lot of international experience and he, saw the future of Asia long before a lot of people called it. And he moved his family to Singapore. Not sure when, but around about that time, 2007, maybe 2008, when a lot of people would have thought that was quite a risky thing to do. I mean, people still think that. I mean, 2018, 10 years on, people still think that Singapore's a risk. But a lot of people saying that haven't been to Singapore, right? And the the usual criti critique or criticism of these markets is that, oh, you know, uh, can't move to Singapore because it doesn't have a free media or a free press or it's not a democracy or blah, 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 all these kind of things. But what we've seen in the last 10 years is the real face of what we believe to be democracy, I mean, if you're living in the US, then, well, you know, what is the choice really anyway? It's a bit of a sham, if you ask me. If you go to a place like Singapore and see how people live, these people are happy. They're a lot happier than they are in some poor city in the US or Europe with no prospects. So, you know, lifestyle is very good. It's very competitive. It's very dynamic. It's very entrepreneurial. There's a lot of support. It's clean. It's safe. Things get done. As Jim Rogers said himself, you know, he lived in New York, which is great. It's exciting, but things don't work. Go to Singapore. Things work. People say, ah, oh, Singapore's boring. 
fine. But, you know, what's exciting about walking out of your apartment block and some tramp lying on the road in front of you or being scared about coming home at night after a night out with your friends or worrying about somebody stealing your wallet? I mean, what's exciting about that? Fine, it may not have the nightlife of New York or London or Berlin, but let's think about this is that you know if if you want the nightlife if fine these are the cities to go to but excitement i think to be honest excitement is something you want to kind of dip into you don't want excitement on your doorstep on a daily basis so for an entrepreneur go to where you're treated best and this is a theme in the report which is well maybe you're not treated best in the places where you should be treated best, which is the old vanguard of entrepreneurialism, which is the West, if you like. Maybe you're not treated best there anymore. Certainly when it comes to taxes, certainly when it comes to bureaucracy and red tape, certainly when it comes to setting up a company, you're not treated best in the US. Look at the data. Time spent filing taxes. Look at the data on entrepreneurialism. Look at the data on the the ease of setting up a business and in almost every aspect, every ranking produced in this report, the U S is nowhere near where it should be. And that is sign of the times. And I, I, you know, as I said in the last podcast that, that, you know, it's, this is not a hand wringing exercise because, you know, I'm not reveling in the fact that, the U.S. is stuttering when it comes to you know, being this the land of the free and the entrepreneur. It, it still has many, many great entrepreneurs and it still has many opportunities. However, we now have options. The U.S. is not the only show in town. And the reason why I wrote the Asia Matters report is because I wanted those who were exploring other options to know that they're not crazy and there are realistic and credible options out there which are not Silicon Valley and they're not the obvious choices like London or Tel Aviv for example and particularly those who want to go and crack a new market then Asia really is a great option today and it's not a risk like it used to be the risk used to be that I couldn't raise the capital. I couldn't get access to the talents. Um, I couldn't have the global access to consumers. When I mean, think about those like capital, talent, consumers, th- these are really important things, right? These are probably the, the three most important uh, assets that you need within a, a business to, to make a, a successful startup. So let's look at that capital, talent, business so capital talent <laughs> access to consumers base yourself out of a place like singapore well now you can get access to capital in singapore like you could in the valley silicon valley that is if not in singapore just over the way you can go to china plenty of capital there shanghai beijing talent singapore number one in the world when it comes to startup talent the data's in a report what else was there? Consumers. So here's the thing. If you live in San Francisco, five hour flight, 450 million people. If you live in Singapore, three and a half billion. So what's the risk? What is the risk? I mean, the risk is just mental now. It, it just, of course, not everybody wants to go and live in a new country. However, what I'm presenting is data to support those that do, because a lot of people do. They're not the majority let's say 10% of the startup world would consider moving to a new country because maybe startup entrepreneurs are more likely to move than the average person, which is fine because they take risks. They want to change their life. And within that community, 10% would consider moving country to a place where maybe they have more challenge. Maybe they have more opportunity for that 10% of the startup community. Then I would seriously recommend them to consider Asia as an option and read the Asia Matters report because that outlines why I believe and a lot of people like me 
believe as well. Asia is the best option today for startup entrepreneurs. So not wanting to sound like the PR department for the Asian startup community too much, but I think it's worth pitching the case because for the last 30, 40 years, we've heard the other side of the coin, which is all about the West, the West, the West. It's called hegemony. I can't even say that word, hegemony. Hegemony, which is that cultural narrative. It's about dominant narrative because if you can get people believing in the dominance of one culture over another, then everything else becomes easy. And it starts in many ways with those stories. Go back to Jack Ma. Well, if Jack Ma is the only name of, you know, that, that a non Chinese person could name person could recognize as, as a famous entrepreneur from China, then what has it said about the last 30 or 40 years in the options? Pretty much every name out there has been of a particular type. There's certainly almost always white and male and from a specific background or economic class. Maybe they went to Harvard. I mean, they talk about Mark Zuckerberg dropping out, being a dropout in Harvard. But, you know, he, he went to Harvard, for God's sake. That you don't go to Harvard if you're from the born on the wrong side of the tracks. The fact that you got into Harvard and your parents had enough money to pay for you to go to Harvard is perhaps more important than the fact you graduate Harvard. So Zuckerberg, the rest of them, you know, Bill Gates, Washington University, very, very successful family, professional family. These are the dominant cultural narratives presented to us. And they're almost always American, white, and male. What I want to do is use Asia's Tech Podcast and the network particularly to present the other side. That's why we need to bang a drum. So it sounds like we're drum banging. We are. Because we've had plenty of the other stuff. Now is the time to show people the alternative. And the only way to do that is to show people there are people out there. There are stories from Asia. They don't have to be Asian people. This is about Asia, not Asian people. That's the important thing. All the people that make the ecosystem, you don't have to be born here. And in, in many ways, it's the same for Silicon Valley. How many people were actually born in the Valley? Not a lot of them. What I want to do with Asia Tech Podcast Network is present the other stories because stories are very powerful. And I think, you know, when you look at the Asian tech ecosystem, any ecosystem in the world, they're built on stories. People often ask, you know, what makes an ecosystem great? Well, Silicon Valley is fantastic because possibly the, what Silicon Valley has more in spades than anywhere else in the world is that connectivity. I'm talking about people connecting with people. If you want to get Series A funding, speak to Bob. If you want to, you know, you want to get access to the telco, speak to Jim. If you, whatever it is, that kind of connectivity that doesn't really exist in that level, other place in the world what creates that it creates people moving to silicon valley and it's a sort of a compounding effect right so you get a lot of people who are entrepreneurial moving to silicon valley and when you get a lot of entrepreneurs together then that becomes the zeitgeist of the area which is you know openness pay it forward open to meetings open to helping each other investing in relationships and so on so that becomes a de facto. But what created that was the stories that came before it. So the fact that you have people like Steve Jobs and his example, and you've got Facebook and you have LinkedIn there now. But before those guys, there was Hewlett and Packard and that generation. And those are the stories which inspired people like Steve Jobs to set up in Silicon Valley. And that's really important because those founding stories, as with any culture, are key. And this is where Asia is playing catch up. Asia doesn't have the founding stories that you have in the US, for example. And even you know, you look at the culture of the US, it's all based on 
the founding fathers. It, the founding fathers are no different like Hewlett and Packard moving to the valley. But these are stories which inspire a culture, which create change, which in, invite people into that network. And we don't have those to that level in Asia. And that's why Asia Tech Podcast Network is a platform to do that. I want to share the stories of people in Asia so people can learn what is possible and it plants a seed. You know, I want to have somebody listen to the stories in Asia Tech Podcasts, whether it's ATP Stories or any of the other shows, whether it's Ashley Talks or Simon Kemp's Digital Lives Asia or The Start with Dennis Poe or Kyle's Story or any of the new shows coming through. I want somebody to listen to that show and that, that to plant a seed in somebody's mind. You know, when they move to Asia or when they start their business in Asia and that becomes a success and somebody says to them, you know, they're interviewed by TV or some magazine or even on a podcast, they say, you know, what was the genesis of your success? I want that person to say, you know what? I listened to this story and this guy or this girl did this and it inspired me. It planted a seed in my head and that seed grew and I knew that was possible. That is the goal. That's why stories are powerful. And in many ways, that is why podcasts beat every single media format out there because it's the best way to tell a story and it really is about conversations you know videos i don't know you do the numbers contrast the number of videos in the world with the number of podcasts off the top of my head i'm just randomly guessing this somebody with data tell me but i i would guess that there's a thousand videos for every one podcast out there and there's a reason for that because videos are dead easy to make but a lot harder to publish a podcast because you have to go in deep. You have to give the human angle and you have to tell a story. So where are we? Well, today, ATP 550, I wanted to share with you what was going on with the new website. What's happening with ATP Network and the Asia Matters Report? Hopefully I did a good job of that. You let me know. You can tweet me at Asia Tech Pod. Connect with me on LinkedIn, Graham D. Brown. All the details, show notes on atp.show, which is the new website to host all these new shows and the Asia Tech Podcast Network. Hopefully you can join me as well on helping share, tell these stories because, you know, the more we can do this, the more Asia will benefit and the more the world will learn about what Asia has to offer. I'll be back next week with a new Asia Tech Podcast, Asia Manage. If you want to go and grab yourself a copy of the report, you know where you can get it. It is at atp.show slash Asia Manage or go direct to the microsite at asiatechresearch.com. My name is Graham Brown. Thank you so much for listening. You've been listening to Asia Tech Podcast. 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 Podcast.